Okay, so good afternoon. Well, we've just come from a very successful weekend. The 78th National Party Conference was in Wellington, as you know. Uh, we're delegates, I think you agree, we're in a very good mood and a good heart. Um, a key focus of the weekend, of course, was the announcement Jerry Brownlee and I made about regional roading projects. If we're re-elected, we'll invest an extra $212 million in targeted funding to deliver 11 high-priority roading projects across the country and take another three up to the point of construction. Uh, that's on top of the $360 million we've already proposed for regional roads across New Zealand. So together that's nearly $600 million uh, for roading projects across our country's regions. These projects will make a big difference in the regions, making roads safer, improving productivity and how our roads operate uh, locally. The National League Government has always recognised the vital importance of the regions. Uh, the regions have led the economic recovery in New Zealand and they supply a lot of the exports that pay our way in the world. Uh, so we think this uh, makes a real difference to New Zealanders. Um, there's just a few things I'd like to say in relation to the issues surrounding a foreign diplomat. Um, firstly, it's subject to a suppression order. Uh, we've tested the restrictions on that in terms of naming the country and the advice is we can't do that without effectively breaching that suppression order. What I can say is that we expect this diplomat to face consequences for his actions. As a signatory to the Vienna Convention, we had no option uh, but to observe that diplomatic and legal process. We formally requested the sending country waive diplomatic immunity, but they declined and he left the following day. It was the government's strong preference that this person be held to account in New Zealand, but that was refused by the sending country. As a signatory of the Vienna Convention, our hands are effectively tied, uh, but we still expect justice for the victim. We've been assured this individual will be held to account in his own country. I understand that the Foreign Minister has asked the Secretary of Foreign Affairs uh, to call on the relevant head of mission to make it clear how seriously the government views this situation. We will, of course, continue uh, to monitor the situation. In terms of the House this week, uh, we intend to complete the Appropriation Estimates Bill. That's expected to be about an eight-hour debate. Uh, we also plan to make some progress on the Veterans Support Bill and have the first reading of the Parole Extended Supervision Orders Amendment Bill. Just in terms of my own activity this week, I'll be here for question time, as you'd expect, on Tuesday and Wednesday. On Thursday, I'll be head to Palmerston North for a range of visits, and on Friday, I'll be attending a number of events uh, in Auckland. Are you frustrated that you can't um, even name a country of this diplomat involved? Yeah, look, it would be helpful if I could, uh, but obviously it's subject to that suppression order. Uh, we sought some advice this morning on what we could and couldn't do, and uh, I, all I can do is reflect uh, the advice I've received. How disappointed are you in this country for allowing this guy to get away? Well, it's New Zealand's very strong preference that he would have been uh, charged in New Zealand. Uh, effectively, the sending country uh, stopped us from doing that by uh, invoking that uh, diplomatic immunity. But I would make the point uh, that it's our expectations that he'll be held to account in his home country. What would you say to that country's leader if you were to see that leader today? Uh, well, I would... Okay continue to want an assurance that we have received already that this particular person will be held to account. Now they've got to go through a process, uh, there's lots of sort of complications behind the scenes in this that I, I can't really go into, uh, but if the person was in New Zealand and if there hadn't been diplomatic immunity, uh, then that person would have been held to account and gone through a process in New Zealand. And my same, I would have the same expectations that that would happen in their home yeah, country. What's a big thing? What can they be charged with in their home country? Yeah, so I tested out that point, and to the best of the understanding I have, um, for a variety of reasons I can't complete, and some, one part of it I can't go into, but in terms of the other part, uh, my understanding is that um, they, they can be potentially charged for the crime in their own country. Um, the, effectively through the Vienna Convention they are, you know, if that's invoked as it has been, they can be sent back to their home country, but that doesn't stop them being held to account and potentially charged. What is why, is the, why is the High Commissioner being called in now, only now, when this related <coughs> to events in early May? 
Yep. So there's been a series of meetings held at um, a variety of different levels uh, within MFAT in New Zealand and the representatives of the sending country. Um, I'm led to believe, and I strongly accept that advice, uh, that the home country is uh, absolutely aware at a very senior level about New Zealand's expectations and how seriously we're taking the issue. How would, how would New Zealand react in a similar situation? Like, has there been one? Would, are you saying that if this happened with a New Zealand diplomat overseas, you would waive the right to, to have a minute? We were asking you a hypothetical situation, so it would depend on the country. I mean, we're a, we're a signatory to the Vienna Convention for a good reason, and um, part of that is making sure that our diplomats aren't subjected to bogus um, charges and, and complaints, yep. as, as can be the case. But if I thought it was legitimate, Given what I know at the moment, I'd expect that person to actually face the consequences in their country, depending on the country they were in and the very So given, given what you know, so you have been briefed obviously on the police uh, investigation. I well, wouldn't you go know. that far. What I would oh. say is I've got a, I've got a summary of, of the alleged charges at a pretty high level, um, but I'm just saying it's, it's not something that I think that we would necessarily um, you know, expect immunity to be to preserve. I think, um, uh, as I say, it would depend on the country, it would depend on the circumstances. But there have been examples in New Zealand in the past where people have come from other countries, they've committed a crime, and they have actually been charged under the New Zealand system, they've faced the consequences, and then they've gone home. How will this affect diplomatic relations with the country involved? I hope it won't, in so much that, firstly, you know, we have government to government relationships with um, countries all around the world, and particularly with this country. Um, they're, they're good relations. Uh, so uh, this is the actions of an individual, uh, except that it's their government that's taken the decision to bring that individual back home again. Uh, but we've received an assurance that they'll be held to account. We'll continue to monitor that. If they're not held to, to account, we'll consider our next steps. But what are the next steps? What can you do? Um, I really don't want to speculate on that today because I don't think that's helpful to the process. We've received the assurance that they'll be held to account and let's see where it goes. Are they effectively, with their actions, saying they don't trust our legal system to give this person a fair trial? I can't speak for their motivations. I'd be amazed if they thought that was the case. I mean, the New Zealand legal system has for an extremely long period of time demonstrated to the world that it's free and fair. Um, so one assumes that they've So why are they offering the waiver? Well I, well, I can't oh. speak for that. I don't know why they've taken that course of action, uh, but they've chosen to take it. Why have they told our officials that they've taken that course of action? I don't have an explanation for that. Can you tell us what the alleged victims in New Zealand are, or it's citizen or resident? Uh, I don't think it's appropriate for me to talk about the victim. What reassurances has that country given you that they'll actually lay charges against that man in their country? I don't think they've given us an assurance that they'll lay charges, but they certainly have given us an assurance treating the matter seriously and they would expect the person to be held to account. So obviously as I said earlier, there'd be a process that they need to follow. I'd well, be in a strange catch-22 with this calling of the High Commissioner though, that normally when you call a High Commissioner in and, and express your displeasure, part of that is to make a public statement of your displeasure. We're not even going to be able to report the existence of this ticking off, are we? Or at least who it is. Uh, well you will in, in, on a basis that you can't name the individual country, but I mean, well, that's pretty meaningless, is that a diplomat will be called in and told off. Yeah, but I mean, in the end, I think what New Zealanders will be asking is, is the government doing everything it possibly can to um, ensure that if somebody has uh, committed a crime, they're held to account, and that the victim is uh, given the protection and assurance as best that she, you know, we can in these circumstances. But at the end of the day, you know, a Sunday newspaper printed this article they, in my experience, have strong legal teams. They themselves will have looked at the suppression order and they themselves made the decision not to print the name of the country involved. So I don't think we're getting any different legal advice coming out of the media in New Zealand than we are from Crown Law. Will the government make any moves to have the suppression order lifted? Uh, I haven't sought advice on that at this point. Sorry. Would it be an equivalent charge that this person would face here if they are charged here? That's my understanding of the way things work, but there's a, there's a number of different sort of facets that I just can't go into, and so you just need to see how things play out.
Are you confident that that's the system is up to the same with all of ours? Um, I've got no reason to question that. Would have you expected that country to waive diplomatic immunity in this case? Well, it's a strong preference of the government that they would have. But, but um, would have you expected the other country to have? Yeah, you know, they say it would be my strong preference. If you're asking me the question, would, did we hope that the country would waive diplomatic immunity, that was the strong preference of the government and that was what we communicated uh, to the relevant body here in New Zealand. Uh, that country chose not to do that and the person left the next day. There was a case obviously in 1984 with a Chilean um, diplomat who fled the country after killing someone drunk yep. driving. Yep. 25 years for an apology, a, a, a quite a long period of time before that any action was taken against that person. Um, is there a danger that this, in a year's time down the track this will just all be forgotten and the victim gets no justice? Well, we're going to stay on the case. So um, is we will do everything that we possibly can to make sure that this person is held to account. Because the only other option of this would be that New Zealand doesn't observe the Vienna Convention. And that's there for very good reasons, uh, for legitimate reasons, to protect our diplomats travelling overseas. So it's, a, it's not the easiest of situations, but we're doing the very best we can within the treaty that we're a signatory to. Will you talk to um, your counterparts with this government uh, about this? Will you actually personally... In the first instance, no, because I think what should happen in the first instance is let's see how this progresses. So we've, we've sought an assurance, we've got an assurance, uh, they are dealing with the matter. If no action follows, then let's look at the next steps that we would take. But almost certainly, if no action was to follow, then we would want to raise it another level. But I think we should just let it run through its process first. And, and to be clear, this is a country that New Zealand has good and close relations with, isn't it? That would be my um, description, yes. Just on another issue, yep. the petrol excise tax that comes into effect tomorrow, uh, why is that justified? <coughs> I think in broad terms, it's because we need to continue to be raising more money to be building more roads in an environment where cars are so much more efficient that they effectively pay less excise tax um, over time because they've become much more efficient in their fuel usage. So our revenue in one sense is going down and our demand for those funds is going up. Uh, so we need to make an adjustment, that's what we've done. We've been, that's been a constant program. You know, Motorists will know that there's been increases in the past, but in fairness we are spending a huge amount of money uh, on roading projects like the Waterview uh, Tunnel, um, like Transmission Gully. What do you say to people who feel that extra burden in the public? In the public? Well, I think there's a few things. I mean, when we spend money on, on improving roads, generally A, it improves the efficiency of those roads, so they spend a little bit less in petrol over time, they're not stuck in traffic jams and the likes. Secondly, hopefully those roads are safer. We've got a road toll that's on, on average been falling over the last 20 or 30 years, and in part that's due to the changes we've been making to improving the roading network. So, like all things in life, it's a trade-off, but hopefully they can understand uh, that on, they're on balance they're getting a good deal for this. Is it a good decision to replace a bridge, uh, spend three to five million dollars replacing a bridge that's just had 100 k um, spent on strengthening? In my view, yes, because you're talking about a, a replacement that won't be there for five years, four or five years. So you're talking about twenty-five thousand dollars a year. We spend lots of maintenance on on on, on things. Um, you know, there are many times that people go in their own home and they spend maintenance, painting, or, or putting some filler or something in their in their home because they know in a few years' time they're going to knock that particular wall down or that room down and build something different. <coughs> it's a transition. Can I just ask about housing affordability? Massey's study um, came out and said that the, their affordability index nationwide had deteriorated 7.6%. How concerned are you that, you know, for young New Zealanders trying to get on the property ladder, how affordable it is or unaffordable it is? Well, housing affordability has been a, you know, a long-term issue in New Zealand. It's not something that's new, um, but you, the government is very focused on it and on the issue overall. And we've been doing a number of things. I mean, firstly, I think these special housing areas and generally working on the supply side issues are a long-term solution to the problems. I think secondly, making sure that we 
we appropriately manage the government's expenditure so that we can do everything we can not to put extra pressure on interest rates. Again, it's very important. So we do have interest rates that are at you know a very low level relative to the last sort of 50 years or so. That certainly is a big factor that helps housing affordability. But there are some hot spots around the country and the government's been doing a lot. There's more we'd like to do, um, but we currently can't get the support of other parties for the RMA reforms, which would help in this area. We've also got some issues in terms of getting through the local government legislation in the short term before Parliament breaks up, that again would help in terms of development contributions. So we've got we've got work in the pipeline. Are you saying on those development contributions you're unlikely to get that legislation? I don't think that legislation's going to pass before the election. So do the President give the Parliament enough time? I think it's a combination of time and support. Um, but my main understanding is support. I think it's one of those ones that again is locked at sort of 60 or do you think Holly Walker's um, decision to depart politics will affect National's campaign in the Cup South? Um, I saw something that saying that she was going to continue to run as a candidate, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. How could she do that when she's leaving? Well, she's, she's not going to go back on the list. Uh, oh, so right, she okay. Chances so she's working on the principle she's not going to get elected in her own right, is she? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, look, I, I don't think it'll make too much difference. I mean, it's, that, that seat, um, is so slightly supports national in terms of the boundary changes that took place there, but we're still behind. I mean, it's still Labour's seat to hold parts out. Um, but we're going to work hard in that seat. We've got a very, very good candidate with Chris Fisher. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not sure it'll make a massive amount of difference. And just on the, on the diplomat case, is there something wrong with New Zealand suppression laws when we can't even name the country that this guy's from? <coughs> well, the suppression law was set by the Wellington District Court. I mean, they are the people that make the, the call about whether the, the breadth and, and sort of um, depth, if you like, of the suppression order. I'm not an expert in those areas. All I can do is observe them. So would the um, High Commissioner be, be, be being called in this week if the Herald on Sunday hadn't run the story? Uh, I can't absolutely confirm that one way or the other. What I can say is there's been lots of discussions and lots of meetings taking place, as I understand it, in a variety of different levels. And this is just another one of those meetings. There's been quite a few. And my understanding is further up their political system, there's a strong understanding of both the issue and the expectations of New Zealand. When did you first become aware of that? Um, when it first happened, I had a very kind of, sometime after that, it was in May that the event took place. So sometime after that, I got a, a fairly top line sort of briefing. It wasn't in any kind of detail, but a, a really, I only got a really detailed description of what was going on uh, on Saturday. Did and you what do the government do at that point? That's well, that's when I was advised, I was advised there was, there's, a, there's a number of factors that make it difficult for me to explain about why, you know, why when I was originally told we didn't, uh, I wasn't so actively involved, but, but what I can tell you is that the, it was handled, it was always being handled by foreign affairs. Did you intend to make it public at some stage? Don't know, actually. Um, I mean, I've it was never sort of tested or discussed in my life. Can, can you confirm the date that the diplomat left? Um, well, I can tell you it was the day after that issue. I can't give you the exact date. Why would you not make something like that public? I mean, if the case has come up in court, charges are laid, and then presumably well, the we, case we, disappears, yep. um, isn't it a problem on the government to tell the public what's going on? I don't think so. I mean, it would be much more helpful if I could give you all, all of the pieces of the puzzle. And at the moment, I can't do that. I can't tell you the country that the individual's from. I can't tell you what action has taken <coughs> in, the, uh, in the sending country. Um, I can't tell you some of the other parts of the particular issue. Um, so it, it would be much more helpful if I could give you all of that information. Now, whether we would or wouldn't have done that sometime further down the track is a bit of a moot point, really. Have there been any other cases where people have asked or got diplomatic immunity while you've been Prime Minister? I can't call that, but I'd need to check to be precise. And is it just the suppression order that is preventing you from talking about, or is there something else that's preventing no, you? That's the suppression order for that. On Friday, the New Zealand dollar had a record high on a trade weight index basis, even though our log and dairy prices are down 20 to 30%. Are you concerned this is going to affect the government's strategy of lifting exports and the economy? Well, I think as Billing has said at the conference, actually, credit has to go to exporters in New Zealand for the tremendous job they've been doing about lifting productivity and efficiency in their workplaces. Um, that 
in essence, I mean, while I accept it's hit a sort of uh, a high point, primarily in the post flow time, but certainly a very high level, um, it, they've been exporters have actually, in terms of the Kiwi US rate, have been having to deal with very high levels for quite a long period of time, actually, and they've adjusted incredibly. I mean, what we would say is that generally speaking, uh, when you see commodity prices coming back, generally that's reflected in movements in the exchange rate over time. So I accept there's a bit of a lead and lag with some of these things, there's lots of different factors, but I suspect if commodity prices continue to come back, you'll see a reduction in the Kiwi US rate. So you'd expect it to fall? I would, yes. And if it doesn't, do you think there's a problem with the government's strategy? Or well, it's, not, it's, it's not the government's strategy. I mean, these things are never a perfect science. And as we know, generally if interest rates fall, the exchange rate falls, and generally if interest rates rise, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, ex uh, the exchange rate rises. But, but we, I, I remember plenty of times when Don was the, Brash was the governor and the rates went up and the exchange rate fell. It's a, it's a fickle beast. Okay, thanks.